Hi, I'm Andrew Schmidt. I'm assistant professor of, uh, of emergency medicine at the University of Florida Jacksonville. I'm medical director of Jacksonville Beach Ocean Rescue. I'm director of Lifeguards Without Borders, and I sit on the Red Cross Scientific Advisory Council for Water Safety. So today we're going to talk about drowning and where we are in 2021. We're going to attack this from a couple different ways. First off, we're going to review quick epidemiology, not just in the U.S., but also around the world. Then we're going to talk about the current state of drowning from a public health perspective. And the way we're going to talk about that is through policy, education, and research. So why drowning? Well, obviously we're here at a conference that's focused on water safety and drowning, so that kind of makes sense. But more importantly, in the U.S., it's the leading cause of unintentional injury-related death for children ages 1 to 4. Beyond this globally, drowning is the third leading cause of unintentional injury death. So let's focus a little more on the epidemiology. I like to divide folks into three kind of broad age groups when we start talking about drowning, focusing on our younger individuals. On the left, we have the infants. In the middle, we have the toddlers. On the right, we have our teenage and 20s. Now, when we talk about total deaths, it makes sense that our toddlers lead the way. Um, I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old, and I like to joke that their job from the time the sun up comes up to when it goes down is to kind of make dad look stupid and try to get themselves hurt. They toddle around. Um, so it makes sense that these kids are the ones that are able to get themselves into trouble, whether it be in a pool um, or an open body of water. When we talk about bathtub injuries and death, uh, it makes sense that our infants have the highest mortality and morbidity. Uh, these infants obviously can't hold themselves up, so they may be placed in a bathtub, and mom or dad may go do something for a minute and come back and find the baby underwater. Um, or even worse, a sibling may be holding the child underwater in an attempt to play with them. As I alluded to before, toddlers, yeah, they, they get in trouble. They toddle. They, they have some uh, sort of confidence. They, some of them may have taken some water safety or sorry, swimming lessons, so may feel more comfortable around pools. And now a toy falls in the pool, and they want to go get it, and they end up in the water. With natural bodies of water, our teenagers in our uh, 20s, uh, we start having high-risk activities. Alcohol becomes an issue. Many of these individuals, again, may have some experience swimming, but now they find themselves in a lake or an ocean or a river uh, where the actual elements and the conditions are beyond their physical capabilities. Now, it's important to always keep in mind that 91% of drowning deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries. It's obviously a big problem in the U.S., but it's a much bigger problem in other countries. Uh, many places water sustains life. It's not just for recreation, but it's the way that people get food through fishing. It's the way they wash their clothes and bodies of water. Uh, there are many unguarded bodies of water without fencing, without proper barriers that people live around um, around the world. So we have to keep that in focus that while it's a big problem in the U.S., it's a much bigger problem other places. So around the world, there's estimated about 400,000 drowning deaths per year. That's a big number. Uh, but it, it is not what the number actually is. That's a gross underestimate. We need to keep in mind that this doesn't usually doesn't include homicides and suicides. In some countries like Ireland, death by suicide by drowning is actually a big problem. It also usually doesn't include large natural disasters. So a tsunami comes through and wipes out a thousand people, many of which probably drowned. Those statistics uh, often aren't actually counted. Also, if a ferry disaster, maybe a boat flips over and 100 people drown, uh, these are often not taken into account. We also have to think about the quality of data in some countries. In the U.S., we don't have the best data, but it's not terrible, but we actually have at least a centralized data system through the CDC. But many countries, it's just someone's hobby, and they collect newspaper clippings, and that may be the best data set they have in the country. Uh, so low quality of data also affects this number. We can see this map put out by WHO a few years ago in their International Drowning Report. And it was talking about drowning being a leading cause of death among 1 to 14 year olds around the world. You can see the dark blue um, countries, it shows that drowning is within the first five causes of death. So, the US, Canada, uh, many places in South America as well. And the main problem, though, is, is that you can see many gray countries. And these are the ones that data either did not meet inclusion criteria or data not available or data not applicable. And you can see most of Africa um, and much of Asia is in this category. And if you actually look at the statistics that other people have counted, we'll find that some of the highest morbidity and mortality in the world are in these countries and in these continents. Um, this is where we actually don't have good data. There is some uh, good research on this recently. Uh, this is by Richard Franklin, a um, big name in, in uh, drowning research, and some of his colleagues. And they're looking at the burden of unintentional drowning globally um, based on the Global Burden of Disease 2017 study. And 
some things they found. First off, this is a 2017 map that they were able to crunch some numbers and find. And the colors are based on the age standardized uh, cause specific mortality per 100,000 for drowning. Uh, you can see the blues are kind of low uh, mortality rates, and as we get to the darker reds, it's high, high mortality rates. So it's important to understand that four countries, China, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, all together, those four countries accounted for half of all drowning deaths. Uh, so you can see where population and population density uh, play a role. And then they counted around 295,000 uh, unintentional drowning deaths in 2017, which I actually found was a pretty large reduction from the last uh, couple decades, which is good. And if you're wondering some of these darker countries that have a high burden, uh, the dark red in Central Af is the Central African Republic, and the, another one near Australia is Papua New Guinea. Um, so these countries having greater than 9 per 100,000 uh, mortality rates, which in the U.S. we usually sit around 1 to 2. So you can see some places having almost tenfold increase in mortality rates due to drowning. And this graph is looking at the incidence of unintentional drowning by age group and super region. And the takeaways from this graph were 1 to 4-year-olds led the way by far. So 1 to 4-year-olds at big bar at the very bottom there, um, and they pretty much led the way in all uh, super regions of the world. Males uh, had a higher burden of disease and mortality than females, which we expect. We've, we've seen that in multiple different studies. Uh, high income countries with, uh, had, have an increase in geriatric drownings. So there's some interesting, interesting studies out of Japan where geriatrics are actually one of their highest uh, mortality burden groups. Uh, and that's due to some different behavioral uh, things and in, in the use of spas and, and pools later in life. And then children in residents in countries of Asian Africa, males and low socioeconomic status uh, were all predictors of high mortality. This graph looks at the incidence of unintentional drowning mortality by region and age groups. And takeaways from this is West Sub-Saharan Africa had a huge burden um, with their population of just less than five-year-olds larger than all of U.S. burden of disease. Uh, Southeast and East Asia had a large burden in older populations like I just talked about. In Australia, if you look all the way down the bottom, Australia has a very low burden of disease mortality. Uh, we've seen this uh, in most studies we look at. And one thing that plays into this is just having a culture of water competency and water safety. If anyone spent time in Australia um, or kind of seeing how they do things, swimming and and living in and around water is part of the culture. And I think that easily plays in uh, to seeing a lower mortality and morbidity with drowning. And this graph was very nice because that kind of plays out over the years from 1990 to 2017 and looked at the age standardized cause specific mortality per 100,000 uh, for unintentional drowning. Uh, main takeaways is that there's a decrease seen across all regions. So obviously that's, that's good news. We are making some headway. We have a long way to go, but all regions did show a decrease. The high income, income countries, which is down the bottom, um, the green line, there, there was a slight decrease, but it was low overall. But that's because we were always we're kind of starting low. Like I said, high income countries traditionally have had a low rate. Uh, so we were making headway, but, but when you look at the other countries that traditionally had a very high rate, they're definitely making a lot of headway. Uh, places like Bang Bangladesh had a huge um, reduction in drowning deaths, and if you're familiar at all with the research coming out of Bangladesh, they've done some amazing things over the last uh, one to two decades to really uh, take a chunk out of that drowning mort mortality for the country. Looking specifically at the U.S., there are around 4,000 drowning deaths per year. Again, still an underestimate, uh, mainly a disease of the young. It affects all age groups, but really our one to four year olds, a uh, huge burden of disease. This CDC data is from 2012 to 2014, and it just shows the rates per state with the darker colors having a higher rate. So you can see Florida uh, can usually leads the way in drowning deaths and drowning morbidity, but also countries or states like Montana. Uh, now this is drowning rates, so it's not actual actual numbers. So if you have a place like Montana has very low population, you can see just a couple drownings a year are going to increase your drowning rate and actually have a pretty high rate overall for the state. This study came out in the last couple of years and actually looked at U.S. drowning data over a 14-year period, and it was from the national inpatient sample. And essentially, this is discharge level data from hospitals. So it doesn't give us a great picture of what's going in the pre-hospital phase, which is what we really want to know. Uh, but again, this does give us something to go off of. 
And this graph here looked at incidence trend in drowning related hospitalizations in children and adolescents over that period from around 2003 to 2016. And the takeaways from this are that the estimated incidence of drowning was about 1.87 per 100,000 in 2016, uh, which is in line with other, stu with other studies. Uh, that's a slight downtrend over time, so again, it's good, but it, like I said, you compare it to places uh, like Democratic Republic of Congo, where sometimes it's 10 per 100,000. Uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to be pretty low relative on the global scale. Uh, and the mortality it decreased overall uh, throughout the years. Which, again, we're going in the right direction. Uh, the association with mortality, uh, kids less than five had a high risk of mortality, and also males greater than females. And then finally, I'll use Florida as an example because that's where I'm from. We have some good data here. So around 400 deaths per year in Florida. I just put this up because this shows a little bit of trend. This is from the Florida Department of Children's and Families. It's important to understand that this is just cases that, re that are reported to them. So this slide is from about, I think last week I took this data. So we, we've we had up to date this year, 19 deaths, drowning deaths in children reported to Florida DCF. Uh, but you can see in the green there, that's a trend over time that things, uh, cases reported to them kind of had an uptick in 2018 back down and kind of coming back up in 2020. Uh, but overall pretty consistent. But then more importantly, left in the blue, you can see the one to three year olds have, having the highest fatality rates. But again, this is just uh, cases that are reported to Florida DCF. So it doesn't track all numbers. Uh, you can do some heat maps on their website based on this. So just so we can see, it makes sense, our highly populated area. So especially Miami, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, Tampa, um, Orlando, having the highest burden of disease and mortality across the state. So as I said in the introduction, we're going to attack this kind of from a public health standpoint. And there's lots of ways to define public health and look at different disease entities, but you can kind of parse it out into three different categories, policy, education, and research. And that's how we're going to talk about drowning and where we are in 2021. Now we're going to take this from a global perspective. Uh, we talk about things like policy. There's a lot of variability across states. Uh, we're talking about things like lifeguarding. There's a huge amount of variability. Uh, there's some things in the works, but it's hard to talk about that because every state's different, every city's different, every uh, area within the city may be different as well. Um, well, we will use Florida as an example just to show some, what some state policy looks like, some things that we have in the works. There's also going to be a lot of focus on pools when it comes to policy and research. And the main reason for this is most of the policy and research that we have is based on pools. Uh, that's just the unfortunate truth. We don't have great data from beaches, and a lot of the statewide policy is based either on pool safety or general water safety. So as an example, we're going to start with some Florida legislation. <clears throat> Florida enacted what's called the Residential Swimming Pool Safety Act a while back. And again, this is just an example of some state level uh, policy that can be used to improve water safety. Based on this legislation, um, pools that are going, new pools that are undergoing inspection uh, for the house to get insurance properly and for them to be within the line of the law have to have one of the following. They have to have a barrier on the outside of the pool. And there's lots of guidelines as to what should, this should be. It has to at least be four feet high. It has to be a certain uh, distance from the pool. There can't be any gaps in it. Um, so there's lots of different rules that go along with this. If not a barrier, then it can have an approved pool safety cover. If not one of those, it can have an alarm system that's on all doors and windows that provide access directly to the pool. And there's rules in terms of how loud that must be. Also have a self-latching uh, system on all doors and windows leading out to the pool. And again, there's some rules on how high that has to be off the ground. Or it can have a pool a s alarm for the pool, like a surface alarm that detects motion in the surface of the pool that would indicate something falling into the pool. Along with that legislation, there was also a call for developing a statewide education program uh, for a couple reasons, just for it to be available to people, but also if you're not within code, um, you could then undergo this education and avoid fines or prison time. There's also Florida state statutes that talk about um, standardized public awareness and standardized public signage on beaches for uh, hazard and, and a standardized flag system. So on the horizon for state level stuff, and f there are a couple states that are trying to uh, enact better water safety legislation. I'll talk about Florida in a second, but in California, New Jersey, New York, all these have legislation in the works this year trying to primarily 
uh, legislate water safety education uh, in schools. Some places like New York are actually trying to mandate uh, swim lessons. A very tough thing to get through, uh, but it, there's hope for the future. In Florida in particular, there's a couple bills going through the House and Senate right now. Uh, first off, there's this Senate Bill 1554, and this would amend the education code uh, to mandate water safety in K-12 education throughout the state. There's a similar one that actually just passed in the House, uh, 1119. And again, this would, what this would do is would mandate schools to provide information on swim lessons to families um, and provide printed out information on local swim lessons that are affordable um, and start building this into the curriculum as well. When we take a step back and look at United States legislation, this becomes kind of an issue. I actually just for fun did a Google search to look for water safety legislation. The only thing that comes up the only is just Safe Drinking Water Act. That's all I can find when it comes to actually water safety legislation. So I think up to date, the U.S. has not done a great job. Uh, there's countries doing it much better than us, to be honest. Uh, Australia, like I said, culture of water safety, water competency. Um, here is just this came out uh, last month. Australian government providing $9.7 million uh, to fund the Surf Life Saving Australia program. And this is in, in addition to the millions of dollars it's already provided um, on a national level. Places like the Netherlands, where they actually have legislated and mandated uh, swim, less, swim competency, where children receive diplomas uh, based on their level of competency and level and swimming ability. And this is actually built into the national legislation. So on the horizon for the U.S., looking to the future, uh, there's not much in the pipeline right now when it comes to comes legislation. This was a petition sent out by NDPA, uh, I believe, last year. Essentially, it's asking for signatures in support of increasing the budget for CDC specific to drownings, asking for $5 million. Uh, this is just a grassroots petition, though. Uh, there, I haven't seen anything beyond this that actually shows some promise. Um, so we unfortunately right now shouldn't be holding our breaths for this. But hopefully um, with folks in this room, uh, we can keep pushing for better le legislation. So we talked a little bit about policy, now education with public health campaigns. Kind of another failure in the U.S. Uh, we There's so much variability within our nation, uh, state to state, city to city. It's hard to really get a cohesive uh, push. And there's so many other issues that we're always talking about. Uh, we don't really have a national focus on water safety. There's a severe lack of funding, uh, no mandated uh, education. There's no national health care system, which then uh, makes it very tough to actually gather, actually gather useful data uh, or make uh, consistent campaigns state to state. Um, so a lot of factors playing into this. So much of the momentum has been done either at the local or national level through NGOs. Uh, so things like the Zach Foundation out of Connecticut, uh, a lot of these growing out of a family losing a child uh, to a drowning incident and then building a foundation to educate the public or, or uh, bring awareness to water safety. Not out of the water. This is a campaign mainly focused on educating on proper use of drowning terminology and demystifying drowning, uh, t tossing out myths like dry drowning. Um, very effective campaign. Uh, Stop Drowning Now uh, are, is a, a national foundation, NGO foundation, been around for a long time. Uh, big focus on education for all levels, not just educating our public, but also educating our medical providers as well. NDPA, most of you are probably aware of, they've done a good job of kind of taking the place of a large national entity to bring together multiple agencies and campaign. They just had their big national conference uh, a couple weeks ago. And like I said, very effective in just bringing lots of these different grassroots organizations together under one umbrella. Obviously, we have entities like the Red Cross. Uh, when it comes to looking at national campaigns. They've done a good job with the Centennial Campaign. This is focused on providing swim lessons, especially to communities that couldn't afford it or didn't have access to it. Uh, to date, they've built programs in 22 states uh, with 65 different programs and delivered over 100,000 swim lessons. Uh, this has obviously been impacted by COVID. Um, they're starting to get things off the ground again, but you can see some of the numbers, lots of junior lifeguards, uh, lot, lot, lots of water safety instructors. This is on top of what Red Cross already does, but this is specifically focused on providing uh, these programs free to communities that don't have the resources for it. And then Water Safety USA, this was brought about in 2014, and this is a combination partnership of government and NGO organizations. 
And the whole point is to select a single water safety topic that all group, all members in the group can agree on and promote that throughout the year. So it's groups like American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, CDC, NDPA, uh, USLA, US Coast Guard, all these organizations have representation within Water Safety USA. And like I said, they just kind of develop a, a message for that year and all back that message and then try to get that message out to their followers. So on the horizon for the U.S., there is something exciting going on right now, and this is kind of brought out through Water Safety USA. It's the U.S. National Water Safety Action Plan. This is something that has been recommended for over a decade uh, through international guidelines is for your country to develop some sort of water safety action plan. Uh, and what they're doing currently, this is currently happening as we speak, we're taking stakeholders from various groups uh, involved with Water Safety USA and developing a framework uh, to support a 10-year plan focusing on six evidence-based drowning prevention strategies. And then every five years is going to look back at each strategy and update, update them. And the different areas we're looking at is data and public health surveillance, supervision lifeguards, life jackets, PFDs, rescue CPR, barriers, and water safety and water competence. So like I said, this is currently going on right now. Uh, so we'll kind of start hopefully seeing the effects of this soon. So finally, we'll talk about research. In Florida, as an example, uh, we have a couple different things. Most states have this. It's some sort of injury surveillance system throughout the states based on either hospital records or pre-hospital records. In Florida, we have charts in the Florida Injury Surveillance System. This looks at fatal and non-fatal data, mainly based on hospital codes. The problem with this is it lacks detailed information that we need specific to drowning. I talked about the Florida Department of Children and Families. It put out very good, useful data. But again, this is just stuff that's actually reported to their organization. The U.S. overall, again, we've, we've, had, we've had no high-quality central data repository with detailed drowning statistics. Uh, to date, we still don't have this. It's something that we lack. And it's really hard to push for policy um, or build good campaigns if we don't have good data to back it or to see where the need is most. Most of the data we have in the U.S. comes th from three entities right now, uh, USLA, CDC, and CPSC. So we'll look at USLA first. The USLA data, it's mainly specific to lifeguarding um, and beaches, because most of the entities within USLA being beach agencies. And it's reported by the certified agencies. Uh, primarily de deals with beach attendance and number of calls for service. Um, does have some drowning data in there. But again, just not the level of detail that we need. It's a great start, especially because it is including um, all of our USLA certified beaches and organizations. Um, but we, we definitely need to kind of stay, take a step beyond that and add some detailed information to this. Uh, this is just an example of the 2019 USLA data. So you can see things like beach attendance, number of rescues, uh, medical aids, and then drowning fatalities on the beaches. Um, and so again, good data for our beach agencies, uh, but to get a more global perspective of what's going on, we need to kind of go beyond this. CDC would should be our greatest hope, but the data from CDC really isn't great. It's mostly mortality data. Um, and then when you look at their non-fatal data, they actually say in many of the uh, categories, the rate is unreliable and should be interpreted with caution. There's just not great data. Um, and again, a lot of this is just based on hospital data. But many of you who lifeguard beaches know that a lot of folks that drown are actually classified as drowning don't actually go to the hospital. Um, if they're a mild drowning, non-fatal drowning case, often they're released to parents. So we don't really have a good grasp of how many people those are out, th um, out there. Then CPSC, so the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, this has actually shown some promise. Uh, they have a large amount of data because anytime there's a drowning that involves a product, uh, they essentially investigate it and write out a report. It's mostly restricted to home pools given the nature of the data, uh, but again, some promise for the future with this. This is all just a piece of the pie. Uh, we, especially in the U.S., need to do better. Uh, the Utstein style rec recommendation for uh, re reporting drowning deaths um, and drowning resuscitation was developed originally in 2002 and then underwent revision in 2015. And what this did was recommended a data set of drowning uh, data for the world, for what this is what each country should collect. In total, there were 78 data points recommended, uh, 49 which were considered core data. And these included categories like patient information, scene information, uh, pre-hospital information, EMS information, hospital information. Um, so 78 different data points that really we should be trying to gather on all uh, drowning deaths and non-fatal drowning as well. 
The closest I've seen to this in the U.S. is the Arizona Department of Health Services, and they have a form that goes along with drowning incidents on the pre-hospital and hospital phase where they try to collect this data. Uh, but again, this is just a single state uh, that I've seen doing this successfully. On the horizon for the U.S., again, there's really not much going on, but there is some hope in the CARES database. This is a large national registry for cardiac arrest. It's done in the pre-hospital phase. So anytime an, a participating agency gets toned out to a cardiac arrest, they have a form, an electronic form that they fill out with patient data. This database is specific, specific to cardiac arrest, and the majority of cardiac arrest, especially in adult population, is not going to be from drowning. It's going to be from cardiac issues. So it's focused on that type of issue. This is a paper done by a lot of Red Cross folks a couple years ago trying to look at uh, drowning from the CARES database and whether ventilations help or not. You can see this is the major data points they got out that they could use. It's by center CPR, witness, uh, public location, gender, age, shockable rhythm, and AED application. And that's all great, but it's not the detail that we need for drowning. Um, so what happens, actually, we, we, the Red Cross, got in touch with CARES database and kind of collaborated to say, hey, how can we make this better for drowning? This is such a useful and good database, but how can we make it useful for drowning? And what came out of that was a supplementary form for drowning within the CARES database. So now an agency that has a cardiac arrest that they suspect drowning being the cause, when they choose drowning, this supplementary, supplementary data uh, sheet will pop up, and now they can choose data that is specific to drowning. So it's too early to see how helpful this is going to be, but hopefully in the next couple of years we have some good data coming out of this. Another partnership with American Red Cross was with CPSC, and it wasn't so much of a partnership as more of a FOIA request from Red Cross, knowing that CPSC had this huge data set of drowning fatalities associated with products. Um, how can we maybe use this uh, to get some useful data? And so some folks from Red Cross looked at this data from CPSC and found about 1,500 fatal and non-fatal submersion incidents um, over a 17-year period. And the interesting thing about this data was that they were able to pick out narratives from each incident. So you can see here, this is a narrative from CPSC. They had this incident uh, with a three-year-old, and an investigator actually went out to the, to, the, to the house and looked at different things and asked family members and friends and neighbors questions to figure out exactly what happened. And from that, the researchers were able to pick out keywords from each narrative to try to come up with some useful data. These are some of the variables they used, type of victim, uh, supervision that was there, if there were any barriers, what kind of search and rescue was used, and the characteristics of the body of water. And like I said, all these were either pools or spas. Out of this data set, they found that Florida and Oklahoma represented the highest number of incidents after adjusting for population. And they found some other interesting uh, facts out of this. First off, nearly 97% of fatal outcomes occurred during time without active adult presence, which I don't think is not surprising. Uh, most of the victims were alone at the time of the incident. More than half the barriers were breached. So I talked about policy and mandating barriers around pools, especially in Florida, but most of these were either breached or unlocked at the time. And then a explicit rescue was made in approximately 20% of incidents, and on-site CPR was reported in nearly 30% of the incidents. And then when reported, parents entered the water to rescue the victim in approximately half of the cases. So that's showing some hope for the future with data sets like this. And my hope for the future for the U.S. is to eventually, through NGOs and through better funding of the CDCs, develop uh, something like this that we see out of Spain. Uh, so this is, a, this is a data repository in Spain. It's mainly built out of news reportings of, of drownings. But individuals go into these news reports and pick out all this useful data. So was it fatal? Was it non-fatal? Where exactly did it happen? What, what events led up to the incident with the age of the patient? All the stuff they can do. And then they're able to put it into these very interactive and, and, and useful maps where you can actually go online, click each incident individually, and on the right side there it pops up with all this information. Um, so this is what we need to work toward. Uh, we have a long way to go, especially just given the multiple factors in the U.S. with healthcare, healthcare systems of variability across states, um, but I think this is kind of where we need to work towards. So to wrap up, in the U.S., drowning is never going to de decrease without effective policy, practical education, and focused data. Um, I hope from this real quick update from a public health standpoint, you can see where we are um, and hopefully where we need to go. 
Uh, that's all I have for you. That web address up at the top it will, can point you to a handout from my normal drowning resuscitation lecture that goes all through physiology, epidemiology, treatment, resuscitation, um, everything from that standpoint. Uh, more importantly, my contact information is there. Um, I welcome you to contact me at any time with questions. Uh, and I thank you guys so much for your attention.